All right, so we are in the last video of this module where we are mixing an entire set from beginning to end. And we started with our drums, we went all the way through our guitars, our keys and pads, and now we are in the vocals. So let's listen to our three different vocals that we have. We've got a female lead, we've got a male background and a female background. And each one of these is gonna have a little bit of a different uh, thing to them that we're gonna have to focus on and use as um, a different element to add to our mix. So. Let's first talk about our female lead vocals. Now, she was leading on a KMS-105, so a condenser handheld microphone from Neumann. And this microphone is great at picking up really good details of vocals. It also, though, has the con of the fact that being a condenser, it's going to pick up some of the drums. So we're going to have to address that, and we'll do that a little bit in this video. So let's listen to what we're working with here on this vocal, and we'll go from there. All right, so right away you can hear there's definitely some drums in the background, and a lot of it's kind of low-end energy. And the reason is, is because the most energy that's coming off that kit, especially with there being a shield in front of it, is going to be the kick and the toms and the snare. The cymbals are definitely in there, but they're not nearly as pronounced as they could be because we're getting a lot of that covered up by the brightness, uh, or excuse me, of the um, drum shield covering it. So. Because our vocalist also was very close to their microphone, they were very on mic, they helped us out because they, did the, they took advantage of the proximity effect. And remember, the proximity effect is when you get close to a microphone capsule, the low-end energy builds up. And because of that, there was actually a ton more low-end in their voice that we actually didn't need necessarily. And what we end up doing is that by cutting out that energy with a high-pass filter, we're going to normalize their voice to the level we want it to be when it comes to low end. And because that means that the noise floor with that low end of the kick drum and the toms and snare is higher than what we wanted it to be, when we high pass filter it, it's actually going to disappear almost. So let's listen to what I'm actually saying here. We're going to engage this. Uh, we're going to play it back here. Holy, holy is the Lord God and we'll high pass. So that's about a 200 hertz high pass. We could crank it up if we wanted to. We'll do about 250 here. So we cut out a ton of the drums by doing that because they're already pretty quiet in the background. They're, they're there, but they're not like super loud. So by cutting that, them out with that high pass filter, we brought down a ton of that volume. And now all we're left is really kind of the more like the smack of the of the snare and the cymbals really but then we also normalize the boominess and low end of that vocal we got to a point where it's actually not super heavy on that low end which we don't need we do want you know authority on their voice but we don't need you know 150 hertz of it and below we don't need 250 hertz of it and below so there's still a little bit of some work we can do here. In fact, the number one thing I do right after a high pass filter is I grab a low mid band EQ and I tame the boxiness of the voice. Let's listen to that. Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Oh, with all creation I sing. So we're going back to that whole idea of cutting before boosting. All we're doing here is cleaning up that boxiness, that kind of like honkiness that's around that uh, 300 to 400 range here. And we're just pulling it back a little bit enough to carve out what we don't need. And then by doing that, we actually increase the clarity in the voice. And then that section where that you can see that little bit of that crossover there at about 250, that still has some natural low end to it that we still want. There's some, there's some uh, uh, beef to the vocal that we still want there. So by doing that, we just went from this holy, holy is the Lord God to this. Now we could also add a little bit of 4K, just a touch, and also just a touch of 10K, just to add some air and some clarity back. 
All right, that feels really great. Let's move on then to compression. So compression in this case is definitely going to be for taste in terms of like the coloring of it and kind of gluing some of the words together and such and the volumes of them, but it's also more for utility for the dynamic range control we can have with it. So grab it again, good old trusty 76 here, and we're just going to listen to right away what we're working with. So before... Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And after... So as you can see here, we're cutting about 7 dB at most on the peak points. And that's pretty much the max I try to shoot for with this compressor in this setup here. You could go more if you wanted to, if you wanted to go for more aggressive sound. Maybe you might even choose a, a higher ratio like 8 to 1 or 12 to 1. Or if you really want to go experimental, hit that all button and see what happens. But in this case, for me, in my room, in my space, and with the sound we were going for, 7, or excuse me, 4 to 1 seemed to be the best for this sound. And the best part about it was the fact that it was only clipping, excuse me, it was only hitting 7 dB at most. And that was about as much as I'm comfortable with in this case, because anything more, and I know I'm probably bringing too much of the noise floor up. Now you can see the attack and release are set at five and three respectively. And the reason is, is because I want the attack to grab notes, not instantaneous. If I wanted to go for a more rock heavy sound, something that's a little more aggressive, crank that attack all the way up. But in this case, I was going for something a little bit in between that and a uh, pretty soft ballad feel, which meant uh, the five settings seem to work best for this. Now I also have the release set at three. And the reason is because I wanted to uh, kind of release gently with the voice. Now you could crank it up, but then that could cause some pumping sounds, which in these songs, what we were playing in this set, it didn't feel right. Now, maybe if it was more fast, upbeat uh, songs, maybe I'd increase the release a little bit more. But for this, I, I like the timing aspect of the release being a little bit slower. That's pretty much all it took for this, uh, for this vocalist to get them dialed in. So, again, this is what we started with. Holy, holy is the Lord God and after... All right, great place to be with that one. Let's move on to the second vocalist. Now, the second one was a male background vocalist who I believe was on a Sennheiser 835. So a uh, dynamic microphone, not as nice as the KMS, but still works just as good. We're going to look into what they had to work with, and we'll see what we can do to make it even better. Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. So first things first, high pass filter. Definitely have some boxiness we need to take care of, so let's grab a low filter. Move a little bit faster here. Still some boxiness. Now we've got a lot more drums in this one because they're close to the drum kit. Can't do much to fix that, but we've addressed the low end at least. Now, I'm EQing a lot differently on this vocal because two things. One, it's a male, so he's going to have a lot different voice characteristics than a female will. But two, it's a totally different microphone. This microphone reacts way different with the same EQ moves that I would do on a KMS versus this one. So this one, I find that I actually cut a lot more, and I don't have a lot of ability to boost what I would like to. I, you could try to. I just don't find it works well in this case. Um, in this one, I like to cut a lot more of the low mids out and a little bit of the mid range. Like right now, I've got a little dip at uh, one and a half kilohertz, which is just there's just some weird like overtones in his voice that with this microphone don't always sound great. And this is what found found this is what felt right to me in that moment. So I could try and add some brightness to it. Let's just see what happens here. Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. I'm going to add a touch. Now, the reason I'm not going to add a ton, because I know I could if I really, really wanted to, but I'm not going to because they're the background vocalists. They're not leading the song. So their clarity of the voice doesn't matter to me as much as the lead singer, because if they were to start going off script or singing the wrong lyrics, I don't want them leading the song all of a sudden. I want them to be more of like a, a layered instrument underneath the lead vocal. And the same thing is going to happen with our other background vocals when we get to them. So real fast, let's move on to compression. 
We'll do a similar treatment with this one. Um, I'm going to change it from 8 to 1 to 4 to 1 because uh, I don't think I need that much compression on this voice. So let's listen here. So before. Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Again, we're just using this as more of a dynamic range control in that we're just worried about it capturing the bigger notes and leveling them off to match kind of the quieter notes. And that's it. We could use this more for like an effect of getting some color and some thickness, but we're not really trying to achieve that today with this one. All right, let's move on to our last vocal. We'll go look at the EQ first, but we'll listen to it. Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. High pass filter. A lot higher on this one, 284. Definitely got some low mids we need to take care of. The King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. There's another band of it right there. And you can see what I'm doing is I'm, as I'm moving faster, as I'm I'm grabbing what where I know that frequency is probably going to be at. I'm boosting it. I'm I'm getting a tight cue and I'm boosting it, trying to find it, kind of hone in on it, and then I'll I'll usually flatten it for a second just to make sure I'm I'm hitting the right spot, and then I'll pull it down. Again, let's do it one more time here with that one. So I'm 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 gonna lose it. We'll go find it here again. Flatten it here. Okay, that feels good. Now we can try adding a little bit of clarity in, to their voice and a little bit more of a, a sparkle on their S's and whatnot just to kind of add that back. Let's just hear. And you can hear there's quite a bit of symbol in the back. I think it's as much as we can do safely without it starting to introduce problems. So let's move on to compression real fast. Now, real fast, before we talk about the compression on this one, I really want to hone in on this specific thing is that this female vocalist was leading with a lot less volume and output compared to our two other vocalists. So while that's okay, I'm not worried about it and there's nothing wrong with that. I would have definitely preferred them to sing out more, but because they're not and because of their style of their voice and everything, we're not going to use compression in this case the same way we did in the other two. This one's strictly just there to capture anytime if she were to hit the compressor and need to come down. That's all we're doing. So we're leaving it at four to one. Our attack's a little bit quicker just in case she does take off and we need to tame it. Release is also a little bit quicker just to be ready and just let things go because we're not sure what's gonna happen. And it's set in a way that it's not going to go after everything. It's just waiting for this big moment. So let's listen before. Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. See, we're barely tickling it. Barely touching it. In fact, I'm actually going to pull it back. Because when she does engage it, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to be helping. It seems to be hurting a little bit. It kind of it kind of makes things feel like they're hitting a wall, and I don't want that. And we're going to slow the attack time down just to also help with that. And the release. Okay, that seems good. So, all right, so let's listen to those vocals. We'll bring them in together, and then we'll bring in the band and hear how everything sits in context with each other. So first, we'll bring in our first vocalist. Second vocal. And I want them tucked behind. Same with the other vocal. Because they're not leading, they're just background vocals. They're there to be like another layer. All right, let's bring the band in. All right, so it sounded great before we brought the band in, but now we're starting to lose some separation from everything. So best thing we can do now is to introduce some reverb and delay. So let's bring those in. Holy, holy, 
I'm going to tap the delay in. All right, so let's talk real quickly before we wrap up this video about what we just heard and why you may have the question, CJ, that sounds okay, but I feel like it could be so much better. I mean, listen to all these live album recordings from these big churches and what they're doing or their live stream mix. It sounds awesome. It's like, yeah, they do. But the reason is, is because they mixed it for that and they actually took the time to capture everything for that versus here, this was specifically for capturing and reproducing the sound for a live sound reinforcement system. And the reason there's a difference is because everything changes when you go from mixing for a room versus mixing for a record. In the case of this, everything here, we're taking the context that we have speakers in a live room, we have a stage where there's sound coming off the stage, especially the drums. Even though they're in a cage, there's still live drum sounds bleeding off of that and coming into the room. So what we're doing here, we have to, you know, we have to keep in mind that there's still that live drum sound coming off the stage too. We also have the sound of the PA and it has its own characteristics, but it also will reflect the sound around the room. The room has its own sound too. There's a lot more to what is happening to the sound than what we just heard here. What we're hearing here is very dry sounding and very kind of almost against the brick wall because there's no openness and there's no liveliness to it. Versus on a live record, there's at least six to 12 room microphones usually capturing what's happening in the room and blending it in for the live capture. And so that feels like there's more openness to things and that there's not this like blanket over top of it. That's why there's such a difference between those two mixes and why this may feel like it's a wall of sound almost because it feels like there's stuff missing still. There's still this kind of like energy that's like all this energy is kind of being bottled up and the lids put on top, but you really can't feel like the top can come off. That's what this is all about is that we can't all have that in this mix because we don't want to capture that, reproduce it, and then have it come out of the PA system because it already exists out here. What we're adding to the room is what we don't have in the room, which is things like the Nord, for example. It doesn't have a speaker on it. You got to have it come out of your PA system. And so that natural liveliness of the keyboard is two things. It's what's happening inside its little engine that it makes all the sounds with, but then it's also it coming out of the speakers and hitting the room. You can't add room sound to your mix. Your mix is room sound is completely dependent on your room itself and the speakers and the treatment you have. So that's like the number one thing I cannot teach you over this course is how to blend it with your room other than to continue to try new things. Figure out what EQ you need to apply to either your PA system or to your individual instruments to help them work with the room and let the liveliness of the room add what energy is needed to make it feel live and in person versus this, which feels very sterile and very dry. So I hope that this has been a really informative video series for you on how to go about mixing for Sundays. I find that this is kind of my starting point on how I do most things when it comes to mixing for Sundays, whether it's a small team or a large team, it doesn't matter. All these principles kind of are my starting points for things and how I get things to sound good in my mix. Now, they may change over time. They may change depending on the context of things, but generally speaking, this is where I start. And because that this is my starting point, I know how to get to it quickly every time. So the amount of time it takes for me to build a mix used to be 30 minutes maybe, or I would take my entire Thursday night rehearsal getting things dialed in and then still come on Sunday and dial things more in. Now I can do it in about 15, 20 minutes if that, just by going through all this because I know exactly where I want things to be roughly. And if things aren't exactly where they need to be, I know the process I need to follow to get things where they need to be or how I need to approach my musicians to be like, hey, I'm having trouble getting this sound out of the system. Can we work on it together? And we can have that conversation on how to get things dialed in the way I want them. So this has been the module on how to mix from beginning to end. I hope you liked it. I had a lot of fun. And um, let's go to the next module to finish things up on this course.